Here's an idea. Twitch Plays Pokemon gives us hope for humanity. Sort of. So before we get started, I think it's worth pointing out that this is the most requested episode topic ever. Don't make me beg here. Because I will do it. As you've probably noticed, we usually like to wait a little bit before saying anything, but the depth and volume of the conversation surrounding Twitch Plays Pokemon has been monumental. People are talking about how it's meaningful and interesting and important, and so that is what we are going to talk about. The way that people are talking about TPP. But we are getting way ahead of ourselves. For the unfamiliar, Twitch Plays Pokemon is emulated versions of Pokemon games, first Red and currently Crystal, played via chat on the video streaming site Twitch. You type Type left, Red the Pokemon Trainer goes left. You type right, he goes right. Except it's not played solo, it's played by however many people want to, simultaneously. And however many tends to be in the tens of thousands, all guiding Red towards the ultimate goal of beating the Elite Four. Well, sort of. As you might expect, there are a lot of people interested not in progressing the game, but hindering that progress. Add to that the fact that the stream itself is delayed 30 some seconds and the game becomes a Calvin Ball-esque endeavor of figuring out how to play the game. After a rough spot in Team Rocket's HQ followed by some riots, TPP's developer, an anonymous Australian programmer who wrote the script that makes the magic happen, implemented a voting mechanism. If a majority of players vote for Anarchy by typing it into the chat, the game will try to perform every command entered as originally programmed. But if democracy gets the majority vote, the game will perform whatever the most typed command is for every 10 second period. The input mode will switch whenever a new majority is reached, and as of Crystal, democracy mode automatically kicks in at the top of every hour. Democracy just kicked in! The implementation of this feature seemed to cement something of the meaning of Twitch Plays Pokemon for so many people. Here we are, we're trying to steer this thing, and we generally know where we want to go, which is really part of the beauty of doing this with Pokemon Red. It's a casual game where progress is very clearly defined, but there are also these familiar, external, and seemingly irrational forces constantly attempting to prevent that progress. Sound familiar? This could just as easily describe career building, high school, competitive shuffleboard, life. Pal of the show Andy Bayo called Twitch Plays Pokemon a microcosm of the internet at large. Journalists, critics, and commenters have variously referred to it as an experiment in government, host to symbolic quasi-political culture wars, and a rather accurate representation of the current US government. Conveniently enough, in Leviathan, political philosopher and serious whisker-haver Thomas Hobbes describes government government as though it were a body. He doesn't say anything about that body having to catch them all. Though if I remember correctly, the body is clearly that of a male monarch, and Hobbes does seem pretty understanding of territorial conquest. But he does describe, quote, that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state, which is but an artificial man, though of greater stature and strength than the natural. Hobbes's commonwealth is able to enforce social contracts between its citizens out of, well, mostly fear. Without a commonwealth, there is a war of every man against every man, because there's no consequence. Hobbes calls this the natural state. People might promise to not be jerks or cretins, but only a duly respected power, or maybe a common enemy, will inspire real cooperation. Clearly Hobbes had a pretty sour view of humanity. In his view, the only way forward is to willingly obey a sovereign, to assent to the commonwealth. Otherwise, we'd never be anything more than lawless, violent heathens. The commonwealth pulls us out of a life that is, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A commonwealth is also exactly what Twitch plays Pokemon is missing. Well, missing, with like really big quote fingers. Because the complicated control system, the lack of a central authority, and the presence of Cretans is what makes it the game it is. If you don't count a very hands-off developer, the next closest thing to an external organizing force is the funnel of the game itself, gently encouraging any sane player towards the ending. But the funnel isn't active. It only works because a collective billion hours of button mashing have instilled in us a sense that games are to be finished. How do I finish the game? Show me all of the boxes to tick. I want to catch them all. No part of the game prevents or disincentivizes faffing about like the clock in Mario does. You're not penalized at all for consulting the Helix Fossil a thousand times a day. So maybe Red is our ineffective, possessed or schizophrenic monarch attempting to reconcile within himself thousands of conflicting impulses. Conflicting because really there are two games here. Pokemon and Twitch plays Pokemon. 
everyone playing Pokemon is also playing Twitch Plays Pokemon, but some of the people playing Twitch Plays Pokemon have no interest in the underlying game of Pokemon. They might even have an active disinterest in its completion. So given the warring factions, TPP is stuck in something of a natural state. Sure, there are aspirations towards civility, but property remains unsafe, the in-game industry can't grow, and all progress is potentially fragile. Nothing compels a contract between players except for a shared understanding of the game and words typed into a chat, and well, we've already talked about how much promises are worth. But all this being said, we did beat Red. I mean, it normally takes 25 hours to beat Pokemon Red, and it took us 16 days, 7 hours and 45 minutes, but we did beat it, and now we're well on our way towards beating Crystal. Which is very exciting because one popular view of humanity, and by extension the internet, is like Hobbes's, that without some external force or sovereign, we're nothing but hopeless animals. <laughs> But somehow, in this game where every player has very little control and even less power, a successful strategy was able to emerge. And that's exciting, even if that success is really delicate. And even though it's just a video game, it's tempting to allow ourselves a shred of hope in applying this scheme to all kinds of practical stuff that we've kind of lost faith in. So yeah, we can and some of us are attempting to draw whatever pie-in-the-sky optimistic conclusions we want from this. But what I see is not that against all odds the crowd will tend towards progress, but rather in aspiring towards organization, whether it's for progress or not, even without a central authority we still get shades of it. And that we do aspire towards that organization even within systems that are demonstrably and patently absurd. Start nine, start nine, start nine, start nine, start nine, start nine, Helix Fossil. What do you guys think? Is Twitch Plays Pokemon a model for government or a social experiment? Let us know in the comments, and I choose you, subscriber to... I really need better jokes. So I just started watching True Detective, and for some reason I can't shake the feeling that it is the same world in which Harry Potter exists. I, I don't know why. So, let's see what you guys had to say about Harry Potter and the existence of fiction. Dante asks whether or not uh, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter is in some way like the most correct Harry Potter. And I think that this is, this is kind of, I think, the mark of a good novelist, right? Like someone who is able to make a character that for all of the people who consume the work, they understand who they are and why they would behave the way that they are. So, uh, I don't know, that's a good question. Relatedly, um, PhilosophyTube writes a comment about Frege's um, distinctions between sense and referent and how um, ideas about differing Harry Potters might not be conversations about to which Harry Potter they are referring, but in what fictional domain they exist. Which, as always, is super interesting. And also, I learned that I'm not exactly saying Surrey incorrectly, so I can stop stressing out about that. Thurston Sexton brings um, a really great mathematical perspective and says that the answer to this question is different um, based upon how you define your universe of discourse. And he says that if the universe of discourse is characters in a J.K. Rowling book, then the result is necessarily different than if the universe of discourse is within people. And then talks about uh, how if you don't set up this groundwork, then you run into Russell's paradox. So yeah, this is super interesting. Um, links to this comment, which you should read all of, and all the other ones actually, in the doobly-doo. Brian Malone says that basing the existence of fictional objects on their descriptors is giving descriptors too much reality credit, which is a phrase that I love. Um, so, but I, I wonder, so I met Mike Wazowski at Disney World, I have verified his existence. I guess we're done here. Zeros of On points us towards a Nostalgia Critic video which talks about why people take fictional things so seriously and in looking at those reasons how we can show that they are useful. Um, and John Bollinger um, relatedly writes a comment about how things that don't necessarily exist still have a use in math. So yeah, math angle all around. Really like it. David McNamara and Andrew Conlon both comment on the fluid definition of existence that we used in the video, and I think that this is a totally fair criticism, and that um, a lot of the conversation, like, we were hoping that it would wage in the comments um, because of the information we provided, but it seems to have kind of happened in spite of it. Um, also, Andrew, I am totally gonna use realiness. That's awesome. Ben Ferber writes an amazing comment about the Brechtian idea of drama and how um, when performed, people will think of their lines as being appended with phrases like, she said, he said. It's, this is, we're, we're, there's a link, you should read it. It's great, it's really good. Thank you for writing this, Ben. I'm in, I loved this comment, the end. I have been saying Rowling for years, 
And even today, I asked Morgan, the director of Idea Channel today, and he even said, yeah, it's actually, it is rolling. So I blame him because he didn't tell me, even though he heard me say it dozens of times. Morgan. I don't care how you say it. <laughs> So this is our 100th video, though it is not our 100th episode, so we're not gonna get the festivities going just yet, though maybe we should do something because our 100th episode is right around the corner. I don't know, it's a party? Some kind, maybe? Who wants to go out and get pizza? Leave us some ideas on how to celebrate in the comments and I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll figure something out. But for now, this week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these nice round numbers. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo and the tweet of the week comes from McPherson PR who points us towards an infographic explaining religion in Twitch Plays Pokemon. Whoa. I think I'm on the wrong channel.